Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're going to be following Death's Tidehunter in Game 5 between Fnatic and TNC. This is an absolutely incredible series. I'm sure you guys enjoyed it just as much as I did. And they last picked Tidehunter in this game. Yes, they last picked Tidehunter, and to be honest, at first glance, I see Enchantress to hear with pure damage. Okay, a little bit concerning. I see Death Prophet, right? Spirit Siphon tends to be a counter to these type of heroes. And Desolate on Spectre is also pure damage, so to be honest, to some extent, I look at this game and I'm saying to myself, I'm a little bit nervous about the Tide pick. However, one thing I will say about the Tide pick for a little bit of perspective on why I think it's good this game is number one, it's a really good lane with Mirana. Gush plus Arrow, I mean, it's like, okay, speed, we get it, all right, we get it. It's like a Disable plus Arrow. Nah, but it's, it's you know, Gush is the best spell in the game, right? As Spray is a close second, but Gush, I mean, the slow, it's basically a reliable arrow because it's a 40% slow. And then it's four armor reduction. And Mirana is one of the hardest right clickers in the early game, just because of the fact that she has leap if she needs to, and the fact that she just has a good animation and good range, uh, as well as good movement speed. And so basically, this lane is really devastating. You'll actually see that coming to play in this game. Death does absolutely fantastic. On top of that, Tidehunter is a notorious hard counter to Magnus, which was the last pick of, of TNC. Therefore, they responded with the Tide. And I like this. Tide is also an offlaner who can scale into the late game. And with an axe carry, axe carry does scale well into the late game. But compared to here like Spectre, it doesn't do as well, maybe at the 50 to 60 minute mark. So if you're afraid of that gap, you can pick Tide as well as an offlaner. And yeah, as I was saying, it's good against the mag. If he RPs, you will get woken up, right? You will purge it most likely with Kraken uh, when people start doing damage to you. And you can get off that counter initiation ravage if, you know, things uh, really bad happen. So nonetheless, he also goes a weird build. I know this is a huge S intro. He also goes a weird build, which is why I'm so fond of this replay analysis. He also goes a Desolator Tidehunter build in an official match in the last game of Qualifiers to TI, which should tell you something. The armor reduction build he goes is really cool. All right, let's get into it. If you're excited for today's video, smash the like button and subscribe to Game Leap. You see what I did there? Not like the channel, the, the website, guys. You have to subscribe to the website. That's what I'm asking you to do. We post videos there every single day. I'm continuing to try to improve the content I make over there. And you're really going to notice that if you watch those videos and apply the concepts, you'll get better much quicker. So click the link down below. Give it a shot. There's a refund policy. If you don't like it, check out some of Speed's content. I know you're going to enjoy it. All right, I'll see you guys there. So starting items, ring your protection, stick quelling tangos. Pretty standard stuff for your boy Tidehunter. Uh, this hero just has really bad armor, uh, has a little bit of mana issues, and then you want a Quelling Blade because you're melee. So, yeah, it's it's pretty basic. At level 1, he's going to take Gush, and I kind of talked about um, why this is good. It sets up for the arrow, but he, what how he uses it is he actually uses it to help the trade between the 4 and the 5. Enchantress is a, a good trader. Now, Ench even actually ends up taking heal, which makes like Ench like, the best trader in the game at level 1. But you can see, with this Gush, Jabs is actually posturing aggressively. You can clearly see that Jabs knows that the, that the Gush is going to come out. And even if, even if let's say it's a pop and you're playing Tide and the four doesn't know, it doesn't matter, right? They're going to say, oh, he's Gushed and took 100 damage, right? I can man up now. And so just that Gush is so valuable, especially against a hero like Spectre. You know, you're not going to have any problems really last hitting against Spectre. And so it makes particular sense. If he was against something like a Wraith King, I still think Gush is good because Wraith King's like a low armor hero. But you could take your E to CS. Maybe if you're against like a Terror Blade, you could argue the E is better just to sneak some CS or even Kraken Shell to deal with meta if he pops it at a level 1. But yeah, for the most part, I'm a huge fan of Gush with ranged heroes in lane. The next thing I want to discuss is how to know when to pressure and when to focus on last hits. Because if you guys have been following this channel for a while, you know that one of the biggest things I flame all flame players for is the fact that they basically have horrible CS. And by the way, this happens to me a lot. Like, I've realized it more and more. When I'm playing offlane and I start fighting, it's really hard for me to get my brain to focus back on the CS and balance the two. And so as we'll see from Death here, we're going to go over a couple examples where he doesn't go too far and he harasses Gabby without overcommitting and missing too many CS. So the first example come right here. The best time to harass as a hero like Tidehunter against a melee hero is when it comes in combination with your CS. In general, in Dota, the best time to harass an opponent is either when they're going for a last hit, right? That's number one, when they're going for a last hit. Or number two is when you have a spell 
that you can use to last hit, harass at the same time, and then auto attack them. For instance, Lena, when she wants to trade in the mid lane, one of the best ways for her to trade or puck is to throw out their nuke, nuke out the range creep, and then instead of auto attacking to secure the creep, right, the nuke did it, and then you auto attack the opponent. You essentially do like 150 damage in a very quick span, and it's really effective, right, without making you miss the CS. And so that's what he does here. Anchor smash, auto attack, retreat. A lot of people would keep going. No, you just retreat. You reset. You wait for the next CS. You don't want to aggro the creeps, right? You're just kind of resetting. And then he's going to once again do it here. He didn't go for the auto attack. Probably just too afraid of going under tower here, to be honest. Um, but that, that would be the situation. He actually focuses on this range creep than I, which is pretty freaking reasonable. And you're going to notice over and over again, even though he is definitely stronger than the Spectre, it's not by that much of a margin. And most heroes aren't that much stronger at level two. Like, yes, of course, Monkey King against like, actually, no, honestly, even Monkey King gets bodied by a lot of <laughs> the heroes he counters. Like Monkey King kind of needs level three. And that's kind of the point, like level one, level two, people are not nearly as strong as they think for the most part. So instead of like auto attacking the Spectre right there, gets the CS, then once the wave's pushing in, gets in two free autos and backs off. And this is the key to becoming a good player. Um, it seems very simple, but basically like people will mess it up three to four times in a lane. They'll go a little bit too far or just forget to auto the person after using anchor smash and they'll miss the opportunity to dominate the lane uh, just based on this fundamental, right? And that's what you guys should see is cool. It's like, okay, this isn't necessarily complex. It's just really hard to focus on it constantly and not get baited, right? Like the Spectre's half HP. A lot of people would get baited and just start like gush eing him, but then they would run out of mana, right? And so instead of doing that, He's just buying this Oove, which I really like, by the way. Love the Oove in such a favorable matchup, right? And then on top of that, now, now, only because he's like mega far ahead, is he just full auto attacking Gabby. On top of that, Anchor Smash gets to this point where it reduces damage by 40%. And, you know, the creeps do practically nothing to you. So, you know, there's, that's another reason. And right here is why Tidehunter is nuts. I'm just looking at this damage. So he actually ends up going Orb of Corrosion here. Definitely not something you see every Tidehunter player buy, but I do love it. I mean, it's a lot of HP, which prevents you from getting bursted at any stage of the game. And most importantly, it just kind of doubles down on the armor reduction potential, right? Three armor reduction from Orb of Corrosion, as well as Gush, is seven armor reduction. I mean, that's... Isn't that almost all of Spectre's... E yeah, it's, it's his... <laughs> it's all of his armor. It's all of his armor. And you're going to see in this clip, like, what that actually looks like. Right, so as they go on him, the Gush comes out into an arrow, as we talked about, really well done. And then these autos are just doing pure damage, I mean, essentially, right? And yeah, they almost kill him, but that's like a huge win. And in your lanes, this is all you need to do as well. Please understand that your ability to dominate the lane as a hero like Tidehunter is often not predicated on, on like crushing them at the early levels, even though he did a good job. It's mostly building up to your peaks. And for Tidehunter, that's definitely level four. And with this build, that's definitely the over corrosion. Those two timings, right? Now that he has a point in Kraken to an anchor smash, it goes up from 45 bonus to 90 bonus. You can start popping off and you're going to see him uh, just start to go full aggressive um, at any point in time that he can. And as long as you can have that distinction in your head as Tidehunter, you're going to do 10 times better. Like, and, and really just go play Tide after this video because you're going to have like, the, the mentality of like, yeah, I just need to focus on my CS for the first early levels, maybe hit them if I use my E, but then once I get, you know, <laughs> once I get this level four timing with my Oove, just run at them. Like, look, he's just running through the wave at Gabby because he doesn't take any damage from creeps. And yeah, Gabby's just completely screwed. I mean, like he's just keeping the wave back at this point. Obviously his support is going to try to pull, but just for this as an example, instead of just like full nuking the wave and eating this out like a lot of people would, he's just keeping it back. He's not going to jungle yet. He's not at that point in the lane, um, especially considering Ron is probably just going to arrow the creep. So instead, he's just going to rinse repeat this over and over again. And yeah, just ruin Gabby's lane. Thankfully, Gabby has, you know, an, an, an enchant who made the lane like somewhat playable, but definitely not perfect. Now, in terms of items, he actually went Soul Ring and Wand before Boots. Clearly, he's just looking to be a nuisance. He's just looking to stand still and make the Spectre want to, you know, enter the next life. We'll put it that way. That shouldn't get demonetized, right? Are we good? I think we're good. What I love about Death from so much is his awareness here. You can just see, like, even after he shoves out the wave, he's like, yeah, Spectre's going to farm the small camp. That's just such a sign of a high MMR player to me. Just the awareness to think, like, not... Not, not to think like, what am I going to do, but what are they going to do? And should that impact what I'm going to do? <laughs> and yeah, just over and over again, he's going to auto attack Gabby. Very complicated gameplay. I know. I know. And the thing is, most carries look like this against Tide. So don't feel like, oh, this is like just Tide Spectre. No, like PA feels this way. 
Wraith King feels this way, Jug in most cases feel this way, Slark can literally feel this way. If you get ahead against Slark, which trust me, if you take Gush and you auto-attack him with the position 4, Slark can feel that way. And uh, yeah, you just pop. And yeah, the gameplay from there is kind of simple. You just want to cut the wave and take the small camp and continue to pressure whoever rotates in. Right, position 4 rotates in, kick him out, don't let him get XP, continue to cut the wave and continue to look to get the tower. And you know, this is going to allow you to be some ridiculously high level every single game. The only way you won't be a high level if you stick to this game plan is if you just, I don't know, overcommit and die a bunch. On top of that, please, please, in your pubs, don't buy mana boots after the soul ring. I see so many people go mana boots tied. I just hate it. I really do. I hate not having phase boots on tied. I feel like playing phase, like, tied without phase boots, it's just so easy to get kited. And you don't do any damage. Like, it, it's not even easy to use your anchor smash. So, yeah. Another thing I'd like to say about tied against DP is, like, I didn't think about it this way originally. But tied's actually not bad against DP. Only because of the armor reduction. Like, DP is one of the lowest armor heroes in the game. Really, DP, like, her biggest weakness is probably her lack of armor. She essentially has to buy, like, a playmail at some point in the game to deal with it. Like, just a casual playmail. Sometimes in a Sheepas. But you see in this clip, he just goes for this, like, YOLO Ravage. And yeah, after the Gush and, and the E, she's at, what, three armor? No, it's less than this. That's bugged. Yeah, it's less. I think she she's at three armor because she has seven, and then she's going to get a little bit from the tower. But, yeah, she just explodes. This was, like, a really advanced play. Honestly, I don't... I don't, <laughs> I think it is good to actually talk about this briefly. I don't really recommend doing exactly what he's doing. Um, I recommend doing a variation of what he's doing. So what I mean by that is after you take the top tower, your natural rotation is going to typically be shove out the top wave, kill the nearby camps, and then make your way towards mid. Now, when you make your way towards mid, you have this orb, so you actually can pressure the tower quite well, but you're generally just going to bring attention to yourself mid. Like, that's the goal. You're just saying like, hey guys, I'm over here and I want you to go on me. And that's like what you're doing for a while, like really a long while. That's that's kind of the game plan. And you're going to sort of see that here. He's going to, you know, just continue to pressure the tower and they dive. But that's because they have some like crazy team synergy. This is typically like not a good play. Please do not throw out Ravage when your team is this far away, unless your two supports happen to be a Marana and a Phoenix and your mid is a Puck. You guys see why this play works? This is a big, big, big thing to understand. Because I see Tides do this all the time. They're like, yeah, I saw some Tide like throw out a Ravage. But his whole professional team is ready to back it up. Your pub players are not. And they're probably not playing like three of the most mobile heroes in the game at 11 minutes. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, keep that in mind. So he did end up going Blink next. Honestly, I think in this game, it kind of makes sense. He has a lot of heroes that actually don't really want to initiate, which which sounds weird because it's like, oh, they have Puck and they have Axe. But look at the Puck and the Axe's items, right? They want to initiate later on, and that's fine. Uh, and so you can buy the blink at this point of the game, and it's really good. And hopefully you guys can kind of see why that's important to know. Because if your team has like a clock and a bunch of initiators, you don't necessarily... You still can go blink first if you think just like, hey, my team can follow it up well, even with other initiators on your team. But in this game in particular, I, I really like it because they're playing like a four protect one, right, with this axe. And his other three heroes are just a bunch of backliners, so... If he goes in first and soaks the damage, they'll they'll do well. Yeah, they'll sort of do the damage. Also, another quick side note: anytime you don't have Ravage, just farm. One of the greatest things you can do is go to the dire jungle, drag the two camps together, pop your E, farm it up, farm it up. Yeah, this hero is just good at farming. It farms really fast, and it's not good at dying. So you should be taking the dangerous farm when you don't have Ravage. All right. In this next fight, let's talk about like kind of how to know when to Ravage or like the general ideas on it. So this ends up being a really awkward fight. Bok just got off his Yules right as the Axe called, dodging the Axe call. And so they've overcommitted very clearly. They've overcommitted here. And TNC's hitting them with the flank. Now, on this note, he gets silenced. And obviously he's Tidehunter. We kind of talked about why it's like, you know, good uh, with these other initiators. So he's basically guaranteed to get Ravage off. And right here, he has the opportunity to Ravage. Right here. Now, why doesn't he instantly Ravage? Because he could. And it wouldn't be that bad. But why doesn't he instantly do it? It's because in Dota, for the most part, you want people to overcommit. So, for instance, he wants this DP and, like, this Ench to, like, put their focus on this Axe and then Ravage. Because then his team can properly counter-initiate and they won't focus the Squishies. Uh, right? The Squishies don't have to, like, instant commit. For instance, like this Sunray. If he just Ravages right now, he probably has to just instant Supernova. Instead, he gives him some time to to uh, to Sunray. And he also gives him a lot of time to back up and line up an arrow. And just by waiting an extra second, 
That's exactly what happens. Arrow comes out, nice spirit vessel, they get the kill, and it ends up being a really nice fight. Even though this massive RP comes out here, which looked like it was almost going to be disaster for Fnatic, um, it was enough. And that's largely because DP just insta-died. Only because he waited, right? If he ravaged right away and DP was on the low ground, maybe the arrow doesn't connect, or maybe Magnus can then get the RP off in time, or, you know, Earth Spirit can kick her away. Something like that. And yeah, let's just quickly go over why he decides to go this, like, Deso build. On top of that, he has this neutral item. Just quick side note. He, I love this item on Tide, just because the Anchor Smash gets, like, the burn damage. You're also a very low armor hero, so... Well, you do buy face boots with this build, which helps, but yeah, in general, you have pretty bad armor. So I really like the dragon skill. Super good item on tight under. But yeah, why does he go Deso? So let's look at the armor of the enemy team. Ench, seven. So Earth Spirit has like nine armor. Death Prophet, most importantly, has eight as a mid laner, eight. Spectre is not one of the higher armor carries. He's just not. And compared to a hero like Morphling or TB, Spectre is not that high of armor because he doesn't build nearly as much Agi. He builds a lot of strength too, right? He built, buys like Echo Saber. It's not an Agi item. It gives no Agi, right? So you're not just like tanking up with armor. I don't even think your Agi gain is that high, is it? It's not. Yeah, your strength gain is literally higher, right? And so Spectre's not a high armor hero. And then Magnus is also not a high armor hero. So Deso in general is good when you can put them towards that zero, uh, that zero percent, just because of how armor works. I'm not, I'm literally not going to get into it. Don't, it, if you want to learn about armor, I don't know, Google it. Like Balmy has a video or something. <laughs> <laughs> that talks about armor man that video is really old but yeah it's it's exponential so the closer you get them to zero the better essentially on top of that another cool thing is they have literally zero building damage so i don't know how much this comes into play for death but i would imagine it's quite a lot but they actually don't do any tower damage like none of their heroes do tower damage axe does not puck no phoenix marana no and so he actually goes corrosion deso as we talked about and then shard which does uh, 90 more damage with Anchor Smash, lowers the cooldown by one, unless you hit buildings with it. So all of a sudden, you have a Seizure. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I, I really like this. And yeah, in one of the last like competitive fights of the game, TNC's going to go in. They get a decent skewer off, to be honest. He goes for the immediate Ravage just to try to save Raven. Pretty pretty reasonable play. Walks in, going to go for the E, and you can see it does end up proccing her, her Aeon Disc, which I think gets sort of the R reduction. Yeah, frick Aeon Disc, by the way. Please get rid of this item. I I know, I, I like, I've seen Reddit threads or a Reddit thread where it's like, but Nullifier is like a hard counter. It's like, guys, guys, Nullifier is like 4.8k something gold, and it's hella inconvenient to build up to. Aeon Disc is like 3k gold and, and has like a Vit Booster component, right? Like, the buildups are just completely different, right? They're different timings. It's so bad for most heroes to buy Nullifier, like just raw damage. Most heroes don't like that, right? Like, it's really inconvenient to buy. There's just not a good counter for Aeon Disc, in my opinion. At least that that I've that I've thought of. I'm sure maybe there's something decent, but Nullifier is not the answer. Like, it's, it is it is an answer to Nullifier. Don't get me wrong. Like, I think people might hear this and say, like, don't buy Nullifier against Aeon Disc. No, it's good against Aeon Disc. It's just that it's, it's kind of awkward to get it as a counter because the item's awkward. Nullifier has always been an awkward item. But yeah, in this fight, he's just, like, crushing their armor, right? Walks in... Just continuing to pump out ease, gushing them up. On top of that, you have the opportunity at level 20 when you get there uh, to take gush armor. You can also take gush damage. Now uh, he's gets the amount of regen talent and he just pumps damage as his tide carry. You can see, boom, does like a tenth of, of Spectre's HP just with one E and wins the fight for the boys. And then, yeah, the tower sieger. Yes, he's going to siege. Go siege. Look at this. Oh, by the way, what's really cool about this shard, I don't know if you guys knew this, but when you use it on the tower, it actually reduces the tower's damage by like almost all of it. Did he take the, yeah, he also took the uh, damage reduction. So like the tower, if they multi-shot it, right? If they glyph it, it literally doesn't do damage. Like it just won't kill the wave. It's really nice for that actually. It's a hard counter to glyph. And for his last item, he's going satanic. It's the perfect tide hunter item. It gives you a dispel for all these annoying silences. It gives you sustainability. And most importantly, the active of satanic works with your E. So if you're getting low and you pop Satanic and you hit a multi creep or hero uh, anchor smash, it just full heals you. But as I was saying, this game is not really competitive anymore. Ends up just being quite the stomp as he completely decimates this Death Prophet's armor. You know, usually she's pretty tanky. She didn't look tanky at all. And uh, yeah, they just they they win the game from here. So I thought this was a fantastic performance. I I just loved the fact that like even in a tense game like this, which I think a lot of players would like choke and go 
kind of like weird items just like go like mana boots and not really have this like dominant presence that he had the opportunity to have this game considering he was a last pick tide hunter um was was awesome i love that I, you can clearly see that he understands the duality of tide hunter it's not just an initiator it's not just a refresher hero this right click build is legit and uh yeah you should definitely definitely consider using it all right i hope you guys enjoyed as we watch him siege down the buildings if you did smash the like button subscribe to the channel and uh, let me know in the comments who you want me to review next. What hero, what player, anything, any build. Let me know. Give me some ideas. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. And I'm out. Pipe, 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 peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.